Mr. President, thank you very much and welcome to the SABC. Well, if I may start um, with, uh, I mean, the purpose of your visit, I mean, coming so soon after your election, does that mean South Africa have a, has a very special place um, um, in Zambia? Well, it's, it's common knowledge that South Africa is a big country. Uh, it's a powerful one for that matter in the region, and it's a member of SADC. Uh, and its role cannot be questioned both in the social, political, economic uh, landscape of, of the African continent. So any knowledgeable <laughs> leader would want to, to, from time to time, get to know uh, what South Africa thinks about certain issues which are uh, pertinent to the African continent. Well, at the moment, I mean, um, trade is skewed in um, sort of South Africa's favor, uh, how do you plan to, to, to fix that and where do you begin? Obviously, this is the beginning. <laughs> you know, I think one of the things we discussed with the, His Excellency the President is how do we uh, find a balance which will be acceptable. Right now, the trade balance is in favor of South Africa, say by 52%, Zambia only gets 7% and so on. So. I think it's through dialogue. Obviously, our economy is small. Uh, even if we are given a bigger window uh, to trade with South Africa, I don't think we'll do, be able to measure up 50-50. It will take a while. But I think we can achieve, achieve reasonable levels in due course. And where do, you, where, where do you believe we can begin now? That's, are there, is there some, shall we call it, low-hanging fruit, so to speak? Yeah, you see, you see, Zambia uh, is predominantly a mining economy. It's got agriculture, it's got prospects in tourism. Certainly, we can start from those areas where we have proven that Zambia is endowed with resource and there is human resource comp competence, as it were. Once we start with that, then we can go into green fields. That's the starting point. Well, speaking of uh, mining, I mean, your... Uh, mining royalties and tax refunds um, regime has not, you know, gone down um, well. Of course, you've been uh, trying to fix that, but the resultant, uh, we've seen resultant losses where, I mean, I was reading in the, in the papers over the past couple of days where there are mining houses that are facing um, strikes where their employees want, their, their employees want certainty about jobs. But on the other hand, um, the Chamber of Mines is saying because you've upped from like 6 to like 20 percent, um, uh, they are going to find it difficult not to close shafts, which would then mean that I mean, certain people will, go, will be unemployed. Are you, are you planning to um, uh, do anything? Well, the position is that there are no strikes currently. I'm from Zambia. I came this morning. Uh, what is there? is a threat by the mining company owners to close the mines and put them on care and maintenance basis because they think they won't be profitable to operate on account of the introduced the tax regime and so on and so forth. But as I've said, we've been talking to the Chamber of Mining uh, Companies and the, we had a meeting two days ago. Some of the issues like VAT regulations we have uh, attended to, those have been taken care of. Uh, the taxes, we are negotiating to see how we can ameliorate their losses by introducing incentives and so on and so forth. So there is no strike at the moment in Zambia, but I think the workers were reacting to the intention of the mine owners to close shop, so to say, because the, the, the rules <coughs> and the laws require that notice is given and then you follow the labor procedures and so on and so forth. That's where we are now. But I would like to believe that uh, where there is a consultation, there's always a way. Uh, those people have invested billions of dollars into the mines, and I don't think they want to sink that money. <laughs> they wouldn't want to do that. But what we are saying is that if push comes to shove, and they want to go, we say bye-bye. We'll look for other strategic partners who can operate the mines. Probably that's one reason why I'm here. Mm. But um, is, that, uh, is that not going to hurt you, though? If, uh... Well, it will hurt, certainly. But you see, I've got a job. My job is to look after the Zambian people. And how do I look after the Zambian people if I let everything get away from me? The resource which is in the mine is Zambian. 
the infrastructure and equipment which has been put there is owned by the owners of the company. I'm a shareholder in the Republic of Zambia, and I think I'm CEO. They too are shareholders in the mining companies, but we've got a common asset, common resource. So we have to work together. Win-win situation ought to be attained. I cannot allow a situation where they come and mine and take away all the wealth of the country and leave it with gaping holes and poverty stricken people with nothing to show for it for the wealth in the name of uh, the sustaining operations of the mine. I think would like to strike a deal. As they declare dividends to their shareholders out there, I also should declare a dividend to the Zambian people. This is where we have to compromise. Mm. Otherwise, uh, I'll be fired tomorrow. And uh, mind you, I'm going into another election next mm. year. So if I do anything, see the amount. Mm. So I'm not a fool. Is it, is it your view, though, that uh, the, 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 the tendency um, of business is to sort of is a winner takes all attitude where they want to take everything and leave everybody else with nothing. Yeah, well, that, that is a common knowledge that investors want to maximize their return on the investment. It's a normal thing, but again, we don't want to regulate the industry. That's why we're saying let's talk about this thing. Some of the mines have got very rich ores, which have got by products, uh, gold. Uh, manganese, you name it, it's there, and they are not taxed on that. They are taxed on the basis of the copper price, right? Well, that's the core mineral you know, that they have identified in their prospecting licenses and so on. But the truth of the matter is that there are a lot of byproducts. They don't, do, they don't declare, they are not charged on that. But I'm saying, look, we will not go into those little details of trying to find out the ore contents and the minerals and so on and so forth. We are really on a flat rate, and that's the way we go. But that, as it were, we have said, it's not cast in concrete, it's not cast in stone, it's something we can talk about. We have mining experts, uh, Zambians, uh, who are geologists, who know exactly what each mining company extracts from the mines and what ore content and what percentage and so on and so forth. You don't need to be a, a mineral scientist to know what I'm talking about, but the truth of the matter is we want fair play, equitable gains from the mines of Zambia. And when I say so, I'm not demanding more than what is fair to the Zambian people. Just as much as they should demand what is fair for the shareholders. So I'm challenging them. They've invested uh, lots of money in the mines. And uh, if they're going to close the map tomorrow, what will I do? I have to look to colleagues in the region and beyond to say, how do you help me sustain this economy and so on and so forth. Now, in just over a year, you'll be going into an election. Uh, it's not a lot of time for you to achieve much, but realistically, what do you think um, in a year's time you will have done um, to one, develop the economy of uh, Zambia, but two, to address poverty and inequality? Not much, not much, but I'll do something which I'll be able to point to and say, I've done this, I've done. Mind you, mine is continuity. Uh, this legacy is what was foretold by my late president and I'm just building on. And if you ask for my vision, my vision is shared with that of the party. So in terms of poverty alleviation, the biggest force we are trying to use is job creation uh, through various economic activities so that our people at least can be able to sustain themselves in a decent manner by having a decent food, by having enough to spare to take their children to school and so on, and slowly build up. So if you are looking for a legacy or something I can point to, yes, I'll point to 25 uh, uh, January 2015 and say, I found this thing here, I brought it up there, and that will enable people to choose whether they will vote for me or not. And mind you, we are coming from a history of uh, failed projects from 1964, a lot of failed projects. And when we came in the three years' time that we've been there with Patriotic Front, we've shown a robust transformational projects implementation countrywide and for that I think they will vote for us and me in the saddle with ease because we'll be able to point to something. So you think you will win the next election? Certainly I'm winning. Now <laughs> why was, uh, why, why, why was uh, yeah. the last election so narrow if you're as confident well, as you are of You winning? see uh, I was naive. Uh, I was coming in uh, unaware of the strategy my colleagues had, which strategy will show you by looking at the voting pattern that it was regional, 
not only regional, but in some cases tribal. But I want to destroy this tribalism, this regional approach to issues and so on and so forth. If you look at my cabinet, for example, it's composed of people from the opposition party as well, and uh, even those who didn't even vote for me. But if my agenda is national, and people can see that there is more in that approach than the narrow-minded sectarian approach of uh, regionalism or tribalism, they will obviously vote for us. Well, there are those among your own uh, I mean, party faithful who believe you are doing the wrong thing by going out for opposition, um, I mean, getting, uh, giving opposition mm -hmm. members posts in your cabinet. It's a strategy I've adopted with the full approval of some of my colleagues who are key uh, in this whole process. A good number of those people who are complaining or crying foul are those who want power by all means for the sake of power. Uh, there are colleagues who think uh, it's destined and ordained from above that they should be the president, for example. We were 10, 11 of us contesting for the party presidents. I emerged the victor. But out of those, I've got a few who are in cabinet with me. And some of them are deputy ministers. But I've discarded those I think are not loyal to the party. Uh, or those I think would just be a stumbling block in my uh, work. Or those I think I cannot trust. It's my discretion. And, and, and I, think, I think what I'm doing is to try and rejuvenate the political arena such that Zambians will once again belong to one Zambia, one nation, which is something of worry, you know. And as I come, as I was coming to South Africa this morning, I had the privilege of telling some people that, look, you cannot begin politicizing on every issue. Time for politics is gone. Now it's time to work. Those of my colleagues who feel strongly that I've done them a disservice by not appointing them, they are free to go and join other political parties. Those what who remain in the party should be loyal to the party. Otherwise, I'll phone them like a ton of bricks. And that's easy to do. And, and uh, you don't think other people may read into that a perch? In other words, uh, people you don't like, people who disagree with no, you? No, I don't like anybody. I don't hate anybody. I hate their deeds. Perching in political parties is normal. Either you are sidelined or you're completely kicked out. So if you're sidelined and you go to that paging, it's not paging, it's part of the politics. If I can't work with you at the topmost level, I'll drop you. Dropping you doesn't mean paging you. But if you're so aggrieved, don't fight me. Just stay on the lines or get out. That's not paging, that's normal politics. How strong to you would you say the Patriotic Front is, especially after the death of uh, President Sata? We, we made it stronger. I think I told you, I may have told you, we are now stronger. We will get strongest as we go towards the finishing line. And you, your particular role, because, uh, I mean, your, your rise has been spectacular. I mean, only like three years ago, um, you were a, a junior minister in the office of the deputy um, president. Three years down the line, you are the president of, of Zambia. Now, that's spectacular. How, wh what would you say um, sort of put you where you are right now? I think it's loyalty and patriotism to the party and respect for the hierarchy of power. Nothing in politics can beat that formula. Uh, 2001, I was an inner member of the political party. In its embryo, so to speak, uh, I stood in Shawama where you were privileged to come and cover us. I lost miserably. We soldiered on. The party was growing, and I thought in 2006 I would be given a chance to contest the seat. The party felt I shouldn't. For some reason, the party opted to give us a lady, a clergyman, a clergy person, and I supported her in that same constituency, and she won. Uh, eventually, we were lucky we formed government. In 2011, I was available, and I was given a chance to contest the same seat, and I won. Uh, I was given position of a deputy minister in office of the vice president, and Dr. Guy Scott was my boss. I worked very well with him. Eventually I moved uh, in recognition, I suppose, of my loyalty, hard working and dedication to become minister of home affairs. I served diligently, and the president saw it fit to move me to become minister of defense. I became minister of defense. At one time, as he was the uh, going away and not feeling too well in the, in the latter part of his life, he gave me the rare privilege of serving as Minister of Justice, Minister of Defense, and made me a, a, 
Secretary General of the party. And I served to the best of my ability. And we moved on. Unfortunately, when the president was dying, I was the acting president. I was Secretary General of the party. I was Minister of Justice. I was Minister of Defense. But I didn't want to abuse that privilege. And when I saw that the party was being torn apart, the government was going to disintegrate because there were colleagues who thought that the vice president, Dr. Guy Scott, should take over. I gave it to him. The rest is history. Probably that's my formula. How is your relationship uh, with Dr. Scott now, after you know, what happened in the, in the run-up to the election? I don't drink with him. He's not your friend? Uh, I think he was an acquaintance in the party. A friend is somebody you can drink with either tea or coffee or whatever you drink. Is that why he's not in your cabinet? <laughs> I, I think the reason why he's not in my cabinet is I found him, uh, how can I say? Uh, you know, I found it inappropriate to include him in my cabinet considering where I was coming from. I worked with him, he was my immediate boss yes. for a number of years. And, and, and so on. I think it would have been appropriate for me to consider including Dr. Guy Scott in my government, given where we are coming from. Who is Edgar Lung? A lot has been written about you. A lot of people have said a lot of things about you from being uh, something of a mystery, an enigma. But in your own words, who is Edgar Lung? How do I describe myself? I think he, a true patriotic Zambian who believes in emancipating Zambians from the poverty levels, giving them their rights and the dignity, and ensuring that at the end of the day, they feel proud to belong to Zambia and say, yes, we are Zambians, and in return, they want to save and even die for Zambia. That's what I stand for. Beyond that, there is nothing really. You've read a lot of myths, stories, and uh, insinuations. There is nothing about that. What drives you? What makes you look forward to the next day? Uh, I know that there's God up there. And you know, as long as he's there and I believe in him, he will provide for me tomorrow. He'll give me the energy to go on and uh, do that which I believe is going to bring his glory to the fore. You know, I was one person who campaigned for 23, 24 days, non-stop, and we won the election. But this time around, we won't campaign for 24 days or 27 days. We'll campaign, in fact, from the, the way to go. Right now, our agenda is to campaign by our deeds every other moment that we are in service, so that Zambians can see that these guys mean well and they give us their vote. Who gives you inspiration? Who do you look up to, dead or alive? leaders from our continent? Oh, from our continent? <laughs> Including your country? Yeah, you know, Africa is full of examples, but I think Dr. Kenneth Kaunda inspires me. Because at the time, we had a transition from uh, one party state to multi-party state. Dr. Kaunda had his hands firmly in control of the state. All the instruments of force were under him. But uh, we, the younger ones, were in the opposition and we convinced people to vote against him when he did. There were people who were telling him, why don't you dispute the election and uh, it will remain thus and uh, he will be in charge and he will be eating. The President Gaunda said, no, I have lost and gave all power. And at the time he did so, he had only served for three years. He had a five-year mandate. He just gave it all. And, and, and uh, for me, that is an inspiration. That is, and, and by the same token, I can tell you that's why probably I just said, Take it, Dr. Scott, this is yours. But the people of Zambia and God Almighty will determine who is the rightful heir of this. I think Dr. Kaunda stands out. There, there are other leaders, but Dr. Kaunda, how's your, how's your relationship with him? Well, he's now old, so we don't talk much. But when we find time to talk, we do talk. He's a good old man, very grand. Well, from, the re from the reports uh, we picked up while we were there covering the election, it was that he seemed to prefer the, under the other candidate. Well, he's so loving that he cannot manifest hate, even for a person whose ideas he may not approve. But I don't think he favored me, nor did he 
favor the other guy. And I think he just wanted an even playground. Favor? I don't know. You may have to ask him. It doesn't show. Mr. President, thank you very much. And we wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.